I uh, hope you guys can join me for my lesson. I'm going to be taught live by the wonderful Fred Karpov, who is also on the screen here. If you haven't met Fred, then you're going to really enjoy this lesson. Uh, I will be under the pump, I know that. Uh, and he's going to be giving me homework and practice and things to do. But Fred, give us the little one minute um, about you bio so that people know in case they're not sure who you are. And you're going to see us, uh, see Fred um, discuss and explore these things with us, with me in my lesson. So we're going to be working on three uh, works. We're going to start with um, some arpeggios in Chopin's third scherzo. We're then going to have a look at Chopin Opus 10 number one in C major, the big arpeggiated uh, etude. And then we're going to finish, if we have time, with a little bit of Scarlatti. Um, Fred's going to give me some tips on the trills, lots of trills in, um, in this particular Scarlatti and some repeated notes, but we might just stick to the trills today. So I'm going to jump back onto the piano in a second. Um, for those who are watching, great to see you. If you'd like to chat, feel free to um, leave a message. They should show up and we would love to answer questions as they come up as well. We can even bring up um, the chat onto the screen, I think, if I do this, which would be kind of cool. So we can actually show, see uh, what you guys are saying. And uh, we really want, want to make this a learning experience for everyone watching. So yes, I'm going to be taught, I'm going to be learning lots of things, but the whole point of this, I guess, is twofold. One, that if you're learning any of this repertoire or teaching it, or you would like to, then you'll learn some tricks about how Fred teaches. Uh, and that's always the best way to learn, I think, about advanced teaching. Um, and secondly, we wanted to use this as an opportunity to encourage you all to go and seek out your own teachers and further instruction and keep on challenging yourself as I will be doing in front of uh, Fred, who's a much better player than me. <laughs> I've got lots to learn and I'll get straight into it. Um, Fred's shaking his head. <laughs> no, I just, well, I just wanted to say it's just so inspiring, you know, what Kim's doing. And, and I feel fortunate and honored to be in the situation because I learn in every lesson, no matter who I'm working with. And that includes when, when I'm the student as well. Um, but it, it's really what I think music should be about a collaboration, a sharing and putting yourself out there and taking chances because we only have this one wonderful life to live. And, and so many teachers I've heard get discouraged and they say, oh, I don't have time to practice anymore. And, and I think you know, they're not playing for themselves. And hopefully we can perhaps guide and, and inspire some of you who are watching to take those chances to remember you know, what, what brought you to the piano in the first place. Because you want to give to your students clearly when you say, I don't have time anymore. But you're going to have even more to give to your teachers to your students when you're recharging your own batteries and remembering what it's like, the magic of feeling the music coming through your fingers and, and finding an easier way to play the piano. Sounds good. All right. Let me turn my keyboard on so you can have a look at what I'm playing. Um, cameras, there's a number of different camera angles we both have. I know that there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, the sound is, is in sync. There may be a delay in the video. Uh, we're going to be working on that as we improve this series over time, um, but hopefully it won't be too distracting and it will be okay for you to learn what we're doing. Okay, I'm going to move my mic a little bit closer. That's pretty sensitive. I can really feel the vibration. Oh, can you? I probably should have muted it before I did that. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me see if I can turn you up, Fred. Are you able to give yourself, yourself some more volume at your end? A little more juice. Let's see. This is the only, I, it's almost at the top. If I do this, is that going upward right now? That was, it's now at the max for this one. For my okay. Sounds okay for me. Um, 
can hardly hear Fred, um, Barbara said, so... Oh, no. Um, I can hear you okay. okay. We'll, get, we'll, see, we'll see how we go. Let's get started anyway. Um, so Lee's just asked, what are we doing? We're going to start with Chopin's third skirt, so, so this one. But we're not playing that little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to skip through to bar 243, where we've got these big arpeggiated... Uh, passages and, and my challenge and what I'm hoping Fred can help me with is I can I can play the arpeggio so I'll play it now but as you can hear I, I just it, it's not uh, not regular I, I often miss it and you only get one chance with this to get it right. So what I'd love for your help with, Fred, is uh, some strategies, particularly with the second one, the D-flat one. I've, I, so I'll tell you how I, I've been practicing this. So I'll do um, hands, for example, hands separately. Th that, that kind of a progression just breaking it up and then together. But what I find is just, I can't get it consistently enough that I will guarantee, I know every time I'm just gonna get it. Right, right. So a couple things I'm noticing from here, and we were just talking just before we came live that we're getting used to the lag. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, this is one of those passages that uh, is not, it's good that we're starting out with this because Opus 10 number one is, sort of a progression. You have to keep working on it. You have to keep doing practice, do your homework. This one, I think we can probably maybe tidy up a lot even, even in today's session. Um, and, and I should tell you that um, in, case, in case you're not aware of it because you know, this is the first thing you played, from my perspective, you're playing actually faster than you're ever going to need to. Because you're, so, you're, so I think that's where you're losing some of the regularity of the pulse. Okay. Um, on there, so so you have the and, and what's good about Tim is you have really good momentum, and the flow. I I think well if we break some things down a little bit closer, it's probably better if I put another of my camera views. I don't have two at the same time, but I do have probably the overhead is better first. And That's great. So you're playing the the first thing. Uh, I'll play at a sort of. Hmm, I think it's still in the range of tempo, but but I think. We need, uh, if you think about how you play this passage, right, when you play, right, and it's going to get faster. We have ebb and flow and Chopin, but, but if it's suddenly way, way faster, that might be more than you need. But, so for context, I'll just play a little bit of this as well. I just, before you get to, so you have that. Uh, it'd be nice if I played the right notes, but I'll get there. Uh, <laughs> suggest isolating it in smaller units and overlapping them. So you wanted to go to the D flat one, I think we should stick to that one where you have this one, you have the uh, let's get the right notes. So when you have this bit here, first of all, just check the, uh, I think you're concerned more about the, this arpeggio, right? The, yes. Because up here, that, that the rotation is a rather large rotation and you seem to be in pretty good shape with so I think you're looking for this one, right? Yes. Um, so, so in this case, what I'd suggest is, and maybe we should walk through a little bit for, for the process, not just for you, but for anybody watching. Uh, if you did, let's just start with actually fewer notes than, than um, you would normally practice because it's going to be fairly easy for you. But I think if you start, I'll just do a demonstration of maybe a couple of these. If I go, and notice I'm really releasing quickly. And then I'm gonna, I'm also staying, you can see in this in this view that I'm in alignment. I didn't go like this right here, but I'm, I'm immediately ending up closer to alignment here. Then if we go on, I'm gonna use momentum like this to go. So look at where I went from here in slow motion. It was like going here to here to here. And then, and then we'll go on the same way and then et cetera. 
that sort of. So could you try that out first, just in those where you're going from the fifth eighth note to the first, and the first to the third, etc. I'll stop talking. Try a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I'm too big. Hang on. Oh, good. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Whoops. Okay. This this looks pretty good. The reason why I'm butting in is I was getting used to the lag and also. Um, I don't know if you want to switch again to mine, but if I, um, there's a, just double check to see that your, your momentum, in other words, what I call it is the preparatory lift. And so if I show this from the side quickly, uh, what you see is that you lift and follow through. So this part is really important. Notice that this is what I call the quiet hand. So these fingers here are just gently curved in a natural position. They're not curled. And I think your hand looks good like that, but just be sure that when you lift this way, it's like this. Now, if I showed the left hand, I'm going to show the reverse of that. So it'd be like playing these notes, not those pitches, obviously. Yeah. But so you can see how the, the hand releases on its own, right? And so I did see something where you're, you're doing a little, just a little swivel at the wrist. And I'll show that again now from the top view. And you can see how instead of going like this, uh, just just go to about there where you're in alignment. Uh, okay. And then the next one, and then I'll give you one more, and then I'll get out of the way and let you do it. That this one is a different preparatory lift because the, the thumb on the white note, it, it feels more, I don't know, this is, I don't know if it's more natural, but in this case, we're right before the thumb. So we have to actually come a little higher. Uh, you can't see my fingers, but they're just sort of folding forward. They're not curled, they're not working. And so I'm going to use the momentum to get from D flat to F to C flat in one sudden motion. I think you're doing this, but just feel like you have this kind of slightly elliptical support where you get out to here. And you know, notice where I'm ending up in alignment? I didn't go like this at all. And that would be something that others are doing. I think you're sort of in between. You're sort of coming to here. Mm -hmm. so you can actually be really in alignment for that spot. Go ahead and you might want to switch to the other back there. Yeah. Yeah, you, you picked up per exactly what I was doing. Uh, I, I, yeah, uh, let me, um, yeah. Right, and be careful you don't accent the first note. Let the first one be sort of light, like you're an upbeat to the D flat. Yeah. Better. Good, try the next one. Tim, can you prepare that a little bit more? Like lift forward like this. You can see it probably. We don't have to shift the camera, but see yep. how I'm lifting like this? Just mime it once. Mime it forward. Yeah. And yep. imagine, I don't know if you ever saw those old uh, cartoons, like uh, we had Snagglepuss. I don't know if you know that. But he would go exit, stage left. And before he would go left, his body would go to the right. Oh, I, I can picture that. So, so, so you have to kind of go... You have to, you have to go to go to the like right. Like going, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. You remember. So yeah. uh, it, it's not just me, uh, but uh, <laughs> that, that you, so you're going to have to, to exit stage right. You kind of have to go left first, but see how I'm just miming this and then use the momentum only at the last second. The difference, let me say this for the audience too. The problem that often happens in this place for us as teachers and as players is that people are very conscientious. And what they do instead is they sort of go here and stop, and then they go, right? But that's not what we need to do. We need to be able to let go. So this is kind of a up, down. And this time I go up and go. And I missed it, so I do it again. Try it. I'm probably, I'm going too far, I think, as well. That felt better. It sounds like uh, the lag is such that I can't see it quite as well, but I think you're doing it. In other words, yeah, as long as I'm going to do it really, really slowly. Like if I do this in really slow motion, it's going, 
up, coming down, do, 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 right? So then, and so I think you're doing it. Do it one more time yeah. just to see if we can catch it. Sounds terrific. Try yeah. the next one now. It's a little bit more awkward because the thumb's got to travel, right? Right, but it's but the the key here is this is part of a throw. So a throw, I, I just love the throw. The throw is that spot in an arpeggio where we have to go from the third or the fourth finger to the thumb. So in this case, it's between the D flat and the F right here, right? If if we just for argument's sake uh, or for learning sake, let's say I go to a F major arpeggio just because I can see my hand there. So in F major, we have to go from here to here to here. And the problem with traditional playing of arpeggios is that a kind of thumb under takes place. And so we end up with, I'm going to play in my left hand to show that too, if you kind of go like this, like that. But that, if you turn your hand over, you can see that your hand is tense then. Now I'm not sensing that in yours, which is good, but I'm sort of preaching to the, to the, uh, what do you call it? The, the gallery, right? Now. <laughs> no, but we've we've had we've had conversations about thumb under and stuff, so I'm I'm glad you're bringing it up. We did indeed, and because most of us learned that way, and the problem is, is that that is, I, I view that as part of the uh, I don't know if it's just an American thing. It probably came from the Germans before that, uh, like the Stuttgart school in the late 19 late 1800s. But that notice that if I play, I'm doing F major here. If I want to get from here to here. Hopefully, even though it goes so fast, even on this video, you can see that I'm suddenly getting over there. I'm not going like that, which mm. is a, what I call the funky chicken. You can kind of see that my elbow's starting to come up on the side. And with the throw, if you think of it this way, if we played portato, let's say we play this note, and then this note, and then this note, and the next one is going to end up over here. So how are we going to get there? If we do it with thumb under, then we're just tensing up our hand. And so if we follow the throw, we can actually pass through that. And, and that's what you were working on the throw. That's why this one was a little awkward, because you have the tritone between the C flat and the F right here. But it's mm. the same sort of motion. Like the one you got really well right away was this one, where you lift it with our Snagglepuss uh, <laughs> yep. H left thing, right? And then here we had to kind of do it again. But in this case, it's going sort of mm, this way. It's kind of. And then we, we have to find, I don't know if that's clear in the... In the yeah, video. it is, yeah. But see if, see if you can feel that, I think this one, Tim, is going to feel a little lower, right? And when, we, when I started you on the D flat, there I asked you to kind of go in that direction, right, to prepare. Yeah. This one doesn't need the, the same kind, it's more, it's kind of up and down, but then you head yourself in, a, in this direction. It, feel, it should feel sort of under, like you're coming this way. Sounds good. How's it feel? Feels good. It, well, and any time I miss it is because I'm not my my hand isn't moving across fast enough. It's not it's not traveling far enough. I think. And, and that one, for whatever reason, that one sounded better. I was just about to say what I think something else is. By the way, before we had internet lessons, about 15 years ago, I had a student who would come every day for a couple days, uh, a couple uh, hours on a Sunday. And sometimes if there was too much snow, we would, we would have lessons over the phone. So I feel like I'm coming back to those right now because the, <laughs> the feed is such that I almost, I really can't see as well as I could hear. And so what I'm hearing, Tim, is that your, your C flat, sometimes I think you're um, playing it without sufficient preparation. So sometimes it goes like, and so it's a little bit accented. So instead of thinking of ta-da-ta, Think of it as yadati, yadati. Which, by the way, these are the opening interviews of intervals of something in Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you know that one. No, I know, I know. No. But uh, yeah, it's the, the, the of, I don't know, it's the bassoons playing something. So anyhow, but notice that I have to lift. In a way, it's back to our Snagglepuss moment there. They, they lift and drop but then use your momentum without accenting on your drop on the C flat. Yeah, think of just ever so 
even lighter on the C flat, and I think you've got it. And now even on the C flat to the F. Yeah, that was better. That one, that one sounded terrific. That yeah. one sounded like three, three professional notes, ba da da. That's great. <laughs> so, so, so you get the idea. You're up to here, and you would go on to there. Oh, wait, am I in the right place? Uh, right, the next yeah. one would be. Right, right. So you do this, and you can continue on with this. Now let's overlap them. So you were, you were doing the kind of add a note practice at the beginning, right? Yeah. But instead of that, why don't we do, so, so if you look at your score, you see how we, you just did a stopping on every odd numbered sex couplet, right? We stopped on, the, we went the fifth to the first, we went the first to the third, the third to the fifth, et cetera. Does that make sense? Um, hang on. Are we doing the, we're doing the D flat one, aren't we? Yeah, we do. So we got one, two, three. Yeah, okay. So, so the important thing for everyone listening, too, because this is the part that the way we all learned rhythms often wasn't very effective. And if we can put these processes into practice, you get to start playing better so much faster. I mean, you, it's more quickly it happens. And it's, I, I mean, I, even in the last week, I've had three different students say, well, I really did the rhythms the way you were suggesting. It, it, that makes all the difference. I really believe that. It's not about me. It's about a process and owning it. And so, so if you understand looking at this in the score that you're going from the fifth note to the first and then the first to the third, etc. Now you have the sex couplet. So we need to overlap them. And then you're teaching your body like a great dancer. You're learning choreography. So if you go down to the sixth note, which is the C flat, right? We're starting on the fifth and sixth. And then you're going to go the next three. So now you're going from the sixth note to the second of the next bar, which is right there. So try those. Those two? Yeah, that's, and that's fine. I think that's good. So now go on to... Right, a, you still have a little bit of that... Butta, Accent. Right? You hear butta. Well, it's yeah. also a little, bit, a little bit rhythmically off. It's kind of going... Butta, ba. So you yes. Know, it's, 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 it's your preparation. If you go like that, I think you'll get it in one motion. Like you're, like you're swinging a tennis racket. Sounds good. saw something different because of your preparation. I'm going to shift to my side camera. Yep. And uh, what I saw in slow motion, it wasn't, I don't know if it was this long, but it was kind of like you went. <laughs> so I don't know. So it's like your hand was, uh, I'll, I'll choose a different uh, note. It's like going, I'm choosing different notes, but the yep. left hand, it would look like this. If I went, it was like you went for a second, you were in the air and then like this. Check okay. to see if that's what, if, See if that's what you were doing, if I'm fairly representing that. Uh, yeah, look, I may well have come off, actually off the keyboard, which would, of course, accent the first note because I'm landing on it. Exactly. And what you just said, that's really important for everybody listening, too, because it's, it's such a common problem is that we tend to slap. We come a little high, and, and by leaving the wrist fixed here, you've actually activated all kinds of muscles that you don't need to. Exactly. So mm. this is all you need is a little bit of motion here, and then you, when you come up, then you use that momentum. Oops, I'm just showing you the opposite yeah. thing. It's really this way. Yeah. And so. Yeah. It's. I'm seeing it on the delay, but I can tell that you're not lifting. Up. Yeah, that was good. That that was a good one. Yeah, that one. Really yeah. good. So Felt good. It's, it's like hitting hitting a good shot in tennis, like a really clean one. That's, it feel, that's feels exactly effortless. That's what. That's the ideal. Yeah, that's yeah. that's terrific, and and you can hear the difference right away because the other thing also inhibits good rhythm because you ended up with things like this. You went. Uh, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. It was almost that kind of crowbar was was getting split in there. You're, you, know, <laughs> you don't want that. You want to. You want to. And, and and what I just did, like I made a little bobble. Those are okay. It's better to take a chance to to really go for it with a with a really free motion. And if you keep doing this, so you notice we did, we stopped on the second sex couplet, right? So you know what the ne what's the next pattern that you need to do from here? Uh, actually, uh, you skipped over one. You need the, uh, you need the, yeah, F, C flat, D. C flat. Oh, yeah, okay. Do you see, do you see why? Do you understand why? Uh, well, so we did this, and then this. But you're saying you don't want to do this. 
Uh, yes, actually, that, this is the one that's next, right? So in other words, you, you want to repeat the last note, that the, the, first, the last note of the previous little practice uh, nugget yeah. uh, is now the first of the next one. So okay. You from, so you're repeating that one, and we're going from this. If you look at your score, you're on the second sextuplet, and you're going to the fourth, right? So you're going to there. And then we'll go... Um, yeah, okay. All right, that's that's good, yeah. Because I was I was originally breaking it up into one, two, three, four. So by making the, the grouping smaller, I'm able to get the movement better in smaller smaller bits, and then we join them together. You got it. You, I mean, yeah. And if, you, and if you have the bright biomechanics, and you're listening well, and you're noticing... So you notice there were several different things I was saying, okay, you had this lifted up, it was hanging in the air for a second too long. Even if it's a tenth of a second too long, we don't want to actually hold it. We want to be able to go up and go, right? You right. Have the, and the courage of letting go. Once you let go, you actually gain so much control of the piano. It's so exciting. Yeah. And, um, and so, so just in terms of the overlap practice, because I bet we'll have questions about this, um, and, and you were doing it as well. Remember, the, just recap what we did the first time. The first time we went from here to here, right? We went from the fifth note of that measure to the first of the next. And then we went from the, we repeated that D flat, and we went D flat to the C flat, right? So we went first to the third, third to the fifth, right? And so you go through that process, and then you must overlap it. Because when you overlap it, you create this wonderful lattice. If you look at my hands right now, I'm creating this sort of lattice foundation. That's what you want to do with your practice. Because otherwise, if you only do one, the water can kind of seep through there, the sand. And, and, and so then you, you're able to do it with bigger units, too. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great takeaway for everyone and for me. Uh, because even, even in these, uh, these bits... When I'm practicing those, I'll do. Uh, I'll tend to work in a group of four, and then. And you would be saying, "Well, overlap them, or so maybe, or something like that." Try and just just connect them a little bit, rather than do them in disparate groups, which is kind of what I tend to do more of. Right, right, and actually, you can. This is a place where. Uh... I was just telling somebody recently, I said, you know, I am capable of being organized. I'm not inherently organized. And that person's response was that most artists are not. And that may be true. But, but I think if you're, if you're like I am, and you, uh, this is a place where uh, you can use organization very effectively. And eventually you can do these and even uh, work in these kind of groups with the metronome as well. Like at a, when you're trying to get for speed. And in your case, Tim, remember, I was saying, I think you're actually playing faster than you need to. So you, so you yeah. can actually use the metronome to actually get you back into your, it's like a timing belt adjustment later on. But I would still do all these overlapping rhythms. And we just showed right now just the two overlaps. Like I'm showing a unit here, and then another unit is like this, right? It's gonna yep. be, they're going to keep overlapping. And, and so you're, but you do, in this case, I said the odd number notes to the odd number notes, and then the even to the even. So the, in this case, this is a piece with six couplets, um, and so one could go all the way to doing essentially seven notes, but I would advise that the next step for you after that, I'll go to my uh, camera here, uh, is to take five notes. So this, this may take, th these things always take a little more challenge to explain and make sure they're understood than once you get good at it, then it becomes second nature and you find you have a really, really powerful practice tool. So in this case, I'm suggesting that you go from here, this, the beginning of this passage, up to the C flat, just to here. That's five okay. notes. So you're going from, think about this because we're in 3-4. So it's more confusing in a 3-4 bar to do this because you're going from beat three to beat two of the next measure. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Then where are you going to go the next time for the answer for the everybody who's thinking of the same thing? Uh, well, wouldn't you do the same pattern, starting with the F again? Oh, no, but then it's the same, isn't it? No, so you go from, so first you're stopping, you're stopping on the C flat. You're on the second beat of the, this measure, right? Yeah. So now you're going to go from the second beat, two more beats, so you're going to stop on the down beat. So you need to start on the C flat and go up to there. Oh, okay. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so the thing to remember each time is to start on the note that you finished the last pattern on. Yes, that's, that's a major change from how I was taught rhythms. Because when I was 17, I was taught rhythms. They said, oh yeah, my teacher said, okay, the first time you do long, short, long, short, long, short, yeah. long. So, so we would do this. Uh, oops, I made a mistake. Yeah. And then he'd say, and then you do short, long. So you go. But you know what? This And I was able to learn, and then I pretty soon you do four notes. So you'd go. Oh, actually, it's, uh, I guess it would be, yeah, it would be. Uh, that's five. I should. You know, when yeah, I yeah. To, I was taught the same way. Yeah. You have to go here. But 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 I but I learned. Uh, well, actually, after my vocational injury when I was twenty-five, I realized I had to play better and smarter and more musically because this is a. Let me get back to my face view. This is um, so much like. Um, Everybody's heard about, Mal well, a lot of people have heard about Malcolm Gladwell and his theory about 10,000 hours of practice, right? Yep. And if you, if you do 10,000 hours, you're going to somehow be an expert in that. Well, actually, that's, if you just take it that way and you have to choose yes or no, I'll disagree with that. And so would he, interestingly, because he noticed that this is being applied very poorly. So it's an interesting concept, but it also assumes that you're practicing effectively and efficiently. Uh, if your methods are not good. So he said, and you probably know this word, it, it's not an American word, but do you have the word duffer in Australian English? Uh, you know what that means? Like a, a silly person? Well, yeah, kind of. I guess I, I think it's somebody who's just not very good at something. They're not competent. So, okay. he, said, he, so he must be British. And he said, no, if I were a duffer at golf uh, and I practiced for 10,000 hours, I will be a confirmed duffer. <laughs> and, and it's the same thing for us. And, and, and I was kind of doing the same thing. I remember when I was 18 learning the Chopin, the B minor scherzo. And, and practicing. I remember at 18 thinking, oh, I'll never get this. I did the rhythms. And the next day it was coming along. And by the third day, I could play it at tempo, but I can only imagine how much tension I had introduced because I was using really fast rhythms. And your body can learn that. And when you're younger, you can get away with it. I remember somebody telling me that, you know, at about 25, everything goes downhill. I mean, it's, actually, I, I'm curious, I have a curious story about that because my father told me that I would be an old man by the time I was 25. And so I actually had my injury when I was 25. So he was beginning to look like a prophet, except for <laughs> say that he, he also said I was going to lose all my teeth by the time I was 25, and he was completely wrong about my dental health. So that was Thank goodness. Good. But, 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 <laughs> but, but the thing is, there's some truth to this, that if we're not using, he was talking about my posture, and, and you know, posture is job one for us as well. But this kind of um, usage of our biomechanics, if we really organize our practice well, um, you notice that what we just did uh, was the first of the permutations, at least that's what I call them. Uh, there would be four in the series. Let me go back to this. Um, so what, what I just showed you right now is that you start your passage and go. And if that one was good, you'd go on with. And then a little faster. Which, by the way, I like to do slow, medium, fast. Like, I kind of like to go. And then a little faster. And then really fast. Oops, I missed it. Right? So make mm. sure it's accurate. And, and, and that way, you're also doing something expressive. And so, and then you'd go, the next one would be, uh, where am I? I think you're at the, yeah, we're at the top. So, you'd go all the way to the F, right? It would be, so, so that's now on the third beat of that next bar. So we're, in this case, we're alternating. Now, when I was a grad student, I would have done all the permutations. I would have, the next time I would have stopped on the, I would have gone here, and then I would have gone, do you understand? Then I would have gone, uh, so there it, that was it. too many uh, so I would have I would have gone through each set now I believe partly because I just if you're if you're effectively practicing well uh, you can do one overlap so just help 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 everybody listening to I'm gonna I'm just gonna ask you a question which may seem really basic but remember what we just did we started on the third beat and we went from there to the second beat right so we went and the next time 
we went from the second beat to the first beat. We went right, and the yes. next time would be the first beat to the third beat. So, 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 how are you going to do the overlap? If you do one overlap, what's what's the easiest way to do it? So that's actually too too far. So if we do so this, so this is how we started, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. No. So the first time we actually started all the way to here. So you, you're starting the overlap now. You start here and then go. Then you've got it. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you want, to go from, you want to go from the D flat on the downbeat up to the F. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yep. And where, where's the next one? And then... Is that right? No. Not quite. Uh, you're, uh, you're, on the third, you're on the third beat, and you're going to go to the second beat, so... You're on, the th you're on the thumb on the third beat. If you're looking at the score, look at the score and see how you've got F. Right. Okay. Right. Right. All right. Tell us what the just tell us what the next one is, so I make sure you know. And what's the next one? Um, always, um, always, always repeat. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> and, what's the, and what's the next one after that? Uh, what what did we go with? We went. Uh, yes. 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 yes, you got yeah. it. Okay. You got okay. It. All right. I, I, so, yeah, I think I can. I'm just keeping an eye on the time too, Fred. Um, yeah. The other the other thing I've got to re remember is to do all this with my left hand as well in the same way. Right. Right. Yeah. Exa exactly. And actually, okay. you know, if you if you don't mind, I mean, we can, we got plenty of time to do other stuff. Whether you want to shift to another piece, but I think we're onto something important here. If you want to, if, if, it's up to you. If you want me to say something about the left hand and the ensemble, or if you want to go to something else, what what is what's your preference? I I love. Yeah, I think. Why don't I work on the those right hand bits? And um, I'd, I'd be keen to, keen to just do a little bit of the Opus 10 because um, we want to try and wrap up in the next 25 minutes. Uh, yeah, so why don't, why don't we go to that? Because I know there's some people watching who are pretty keen to, to get your tips on that and see me fumble through it. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but that was, <laughs> that, that was super helpful. I really hope people watching, um, even if you're not learning this particular piece of repertoire, the goal with these... Uh, live streams is that you'll be able to take that and go, oh, okay, well, how can I use this with my student who might be doing something far more simple, but it's the, exactly the same process that Fred's taught us. It is the exact same process. That's something I stress with really everybody, that, that the, the processes that we learn uh, are applicable to all levels of repertoire to really organize our practice effectively. And But we have to also musically understand what we're doing and align our physical intentions with our musical ones. And that's so exciting because we get results. I mean, I think about how much time I practiced in as a grad student. And if I, I think I probably averaged three and a half hours. That means there were days that were probably four or five and there were some that were left. And now I probably average about one hour. And I think I am able to get much more done in that time. And the days when I can really clear out my schedule and get more, oh, it's just bliss. So <laughs> I, th I think of it a bit like um, high intensity interval training, hit training, where you can do short bursts, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, and do that for 20 minutes and get the same kind of value as you can get from an hour's worth of slogging it out on a bike or whatever it is. Uh, that's been proven. I mean, you can be effective. Um, yeah, you have to practice smarter. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. So, so, so you want to play a little bit of Opus 10 number one? Uh, how, you go as far as you want. I yeah, you I'll, I'll just... I, I won't go, I don't think I'll go too far because I'm pretty sure whatever <laughs> strategies you're going to give me will work through the whole piece. Because for those of you who don't know, this is um, the challenge in this piece is that the arpeggios that Chopin has written are all based over tenth. So you have to make sure that you're trying to move and stay in alignment and stay not tense, I guess. And I'm sure, Fred, you're going to give me some yeah, suggestions yeah. about that. So my challenge for this, the difficulty I have, and I'm sure many others have, is... I can play it relatively well at a slower speed. When I start to go fast, it gets messy and I get uh, tense. I, I get un uncomfortable. I, I can't play for it to do the whole thing. So um, they're, they're the main sort of points to look at, Fred. And um, for those of you watching too, any questions you've got, please put them in the chat. I can see the chat on my screen there so we can easily um, answer those questions too. All right.
entertain visually, I think, uh, on this lag. But as we were talking just beforehand, we'll, we'll work on getting closer to sync. Uh, yeah. But, but, you know, good for you for, for, for challenging yourself on this level. And this is one of the great pieces. You know, one of my, uh, I guess I just keep my face on since I'm talking from a, one of my main teachers is Anne Shine. And I was reflecting on how she gave this uh, famous set of uh, concerts at Alice Tully Hall, all Chopin, and she prepared them with Arthur Rubinstein. And that include all, all the etudes. And uh, so I remember one of our studio classes where she had, you know, many of us got up and played. I bet there were eight different students who played this etude. And it was fascinating how many people had different approaches. And of course, she gave her a chance, it was fairly early in her teaching career, uh, to address these problems. And one of the main problems that we see that I think you're not doing, uh, it's going by fast enough, it's actually quite hard for us to <laughs> So I'll, I'll, pl I'll play it slowly first, that we, we want to show that, I guess I'll play in this register, like my hand is on the larger side, um, and so some people get it in their eye, their head that they're going to play this in a position. They kind of see it as, as this chord, or like you know, this. Most hands can't actually reach this comfortably. Um, and yeah, you and I, you and I can do it, but but it would be unwise of us to do it. And right. In fact, the other thing is is that you know it's kind of like um, the the uh, Ocean Etude, Opus Twenty Five, Number uh, Twelve, which I think uh, is also a very challenging etude, but it is easier to conceive of. It's the one that goes like this. Cause, cause you oh yeah. This. It's like, it's like you have a big two-note slur. It's all going in one direction. What makes this one especially hard is you've got all these intervals that you have to negotiate. And so the accuracy, the amount of time you have to spend, um, as we say, woodshedding, or a friend of mine who makes films says, going to the factory. Uh, you have a lot of that technical work to do. But conceiving of it, like look at, I'm at middle C right now just because that's probably, well, I'll, I can play it here too, but I'm, I'll play in this register. and. Notice that my hand is in alignment for this position right here. I'm just quiet. Now, when I go to play the next, I'm going to play the G. I'm going to, well, I'm going to play C and G. My hand's going to go. And actually, think about it, Tim. This is related to what we were just doing. In yeah, this so, very uh, much. Because because it's it's very much the uh, you know being in alignment. But I think what happens is, first of all, uh, for the audience. If I, this is a really bad way to play. This is a quick fast track to tendonitis to see your hand in this kind of stingray position. But <laughs> stingray, that, I like that. <laughs> think, of, think of it, or manta ray or something. Yeah. Like think of how, here's my thumb, but watch the, the next group is, and my hand is still small, right? So the, the, the grouping is not this way, because if you play this way, your thumb is living in the past. I said it like it needs some sort of Zen Zen Buddhism approach. It, it cannot live in the past. It needs in the present moment. And that means it needs to be released instantaneously. But that actually applies to every other finger as well. Because you can see, even as I play this, actually look at this C with the fourth finger. And when I play the E, even that, the, it, the fourth finger releases over the D, and the hand is, there is a little bit of rotation happening here, but I don't want to muddy the waters too much. I'm going to play this and then when I get to the G, the hand opens up just enough to get to the G, but it doesn't stay like this. It doesn't twist. Right. It just goes here, and then you're able to conceive of this figure. And all of a sudden, all of these figures become more like this. They're more like... And... and which are not very difficult figures in isolation. Then the trick, mm. or, or like if you do... But if you're trying to think of it as, as, as being stretched out and that the hand, like we were saying in thumb under, you start to stress these abductor, adductor muscles by keeping the hand open too far. And frankly, uh, Tim, I just couldn't actually even tell because I couldn't see on the video, but, but, uh, but in terms of speed, the process I would recommend is first of all, conceptual. What I was just talking about in terms of seeing that you see this very fast, or I would probably this. I don't. My hands also almost going out of the screen, but you can see that, that I'm getting these fast. But I would recommend even before this, give yourself if you have the patience. I would go all the way to where we were working on the scherzo to go down to three notes at a time, 
and overlap them. That means you're going to start out here and just go. In this case, since I didn't play the rest, if we look at the score, you notice I'm playing from the second 16th note to the fourth 16th note, right? If you look at the score, second to the, the C to the C is the second 16th of the fourth. So the next one, once I'm happy with that, and you see how my hand has ended up in alignment here? I'm kind of here, so if I go, see how it's there? The yep. next one is going to be here. I'm going to do it slowly to really musically listen to it. Couldn't be more easy, right? It's just, do, so, do, me, go, right? But watch what my hand's going to do as I, as I lift and drop. We're still going to do our, our snagglepuss preparation, and then we're going to release this outward. Oh, but uh, but I'm automatically spreading my hand out, ready, ready, which you're not doing, and I. You, you anticipated my next comment, yeah. And let, yeah. Let's show everybody that again. This is what I saw, and then I'll have Tim do it. You kind of went like this. And over yes. There, right? Yes. So, so the hand, you see how the hand is twisted a little, and that's ultimately going to cause you problems to get speed, because instead of that, watch. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go to here, and I'm not worried, even though I have to play this thing, that note with this finger. I know that in the next milliseconds, this is going to move as one unit and get this G. So later on, after you do this set of, of three notes, notice how the hand opens up and releases it. My fifth finger started to open up here, but it kind of ended up around sort of between the D and the E. Now I'm going to put it back at the D, and the, I'm playing the C, and I'm going to go, uh, and notice how where my hand ended up? Mm -hmm. It ended up here, and I think what we were showing the audience is that Yours was a little bit ending up sort of like this, right? It's kind of going yeah. like yeah. So if you, can, if you can feel like this and you trust, you, you, you gain a tremendous amount of trust in your technique and yourself, that you're, it's fine that you stop and you're going to eventually go to here. So then the important part is you're like, oh, well, I didn't practice getting to the G. Well, you're going to do that when you do the next set and you overlap and go start here on the G. And notice that's the third 16th note of the bar. So the next one we know is going from the third to the first sixteenth, which is to this E. You're just going right here. Try that. Can you do that one more time, please? Yeah, let me look. What I'm seeing, Tim, is it's a little swivelly. Um, I think I'm, sh I'm seeing it like this. It's a little like this. So yeah. If you can watch. So instead of that, try not to have, it looks like your fifth finger is already over the E. Mm -hmm. so this is where the leap of faith, and it really, you kind of have to intellectually kind of think about where you're going, because look at where we came from. You, When you came from that previous C, you were nowhere near this E, right? Right. So let's go back to this one, and when we play, where, where do you end up at this point? Uh, is this... Yeah, do that again. Hang on, are we, are we going back to the other bit, are we? Yeah, yeah let's actually, actually do the first C, G. Oh. There it is. Okay. Here, here, here. There it is. And, and you know what? I'm going to have you exaggerate something, Tim. Uh, look at my hand for a second. Even though this is not um, how we're going to play the piece, we're going to have to move. But look where my fifth finger ended up. It only ended up on the C. And if you think about all of those pianists who have hands that are smaller than mine and smaller than yours, they would have to do this. And I think we can learn so much from people who have to be even smarter about this. I once had a, a, a pianist in a master class, a teacher, teach me about a chord that I was playing. And she got after me because she said, I could play this chord in the MacDowell Sonata because I was breaking it. And, and so she said, you need to use it. But she was saying that small-handed pianists are much more imaginative than large-handed pianists. And I really tried to take that to heart. But it, so what I'm challenging you to do is to think like a small-handed pianist when you play from here to here, and let your fifth finger, let's say it's going to go no farther than the crack between C and, and D, maybe even only to C, maybe to C, try it, just the fifth finger's only going to be in, yeah, great, okay, so now, you know you're going to go beyond this, but when you prepare the next one, watch what, I'm going to do it in really slow motion for the camera, so if I go... Try it slowly once. Right. Now, when we do it fast, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with my fifth finger over middle C. 
Go bring your hand back to alignment at middle C. Yeah. See how even there you wanted to kind of rest your hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's a habit that we all develop, I think, is because we see the chord. And because I know how great you are with chords and the pop music, you see that C major chord and your hand wants to... I just to want to play it. <laughs> exactly. It's there. And I mean, you probably play it with this finger, but whatever chord you use. But in this case, this you have to be smart. You have to outsmart your, your instincts uh, that are, even though you, you know that's C major and that's helpful to know, this case, we're, we want to be more like, uh, I said something negative about a, a manta ray earlier, but think about the positive aspects of being a manta ray. What if you were moving like this? It would be much more natural. And so when you're doing, oh, sorry, it's just to hear. So now let yourself do that fast. Yes, and we're in here, that's good. So now we've gotten to the point that I was building up to. I know I have time is zooming by, but now we're going to go E, C, G. Watch this in slow motion. It's going to go. So now when we do it fast, this one's a little tough to do because you have to kind of, I think I'd lift this way to prepare, and then I'm going to get. Try that. That looks great, Tim. Look at your hand. Yeah, yeah it's that's not stretching. Cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> terrific. Yeah. And it couldn't be easier. That's the simplest movement I could do. That's wonderful. I mean, that is the key to this etude. You have to be able to be willing to do all the hard work, which means you go through it and overlap it. Imagine if you were Mikhail Varishnikov and you tried to do this with, you know, to have some great dance uh, routine with locked knees. You know, like imagine if your toes were curled. Well, sometimes they're curled when they're doing point. But, but imagine you had to do it, like the whole, that's kind of what we're doing when we put ourselves into these positions and we hold them. So let's, maybe this, this piece will be a good project for us to keep showing over time. Mm. And if you're able to do the time, put in the time, I would suggest that, you know, if you're pinched for time, cause you're really busy is, is, you know, maybe isolate the first portion. You got to go through the whole piece like this, but maybe if you're choosing measures one to 12 or whatever the passage is, really isolate them and overlap them. And you probably know that the next overlap from what we just did in the scherzo is gonna be a similar one to what we did before where you'll eventually go like this, where you go uh, So, and you can see where my hand ended up, right? So, mm -hmm. Now in this case, remember in the scherzo, I was kind of saying, it's okay, I'm letting you out of doing all the permutations. Well, guess what? In opus 10 number two, you don't get out of doing all the permutations. You have to do all of them. So if you start on the second 16th note and you go to the next one, that means C to C. Oh, uh, sorry. I made a mistake, so I have to go a little slower and I'm going to go fast. Until that feels good. And this is where you can get the metronome going. You put it at a pretty fast tempo and you make sure you make a little bit faster, one or two ticks faster than you want to do it at. So you're going tick, 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 and you go, oops, I missed it. Right? And then I missed that at two, so I'm going to slow down. And, and then you go through however much you want to bite off at once, and then you're going to have to go back and you start on the G, right? So now you're going to go from here. Exactly. Now yeah. watch my, my biomechanics. And actually, Tim, look at my hand before I start. I didn't go to here, right? I oh, yeah, I'm this. naturally doing it already. I'm going to have to concentrate so hard, Fred. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I mean, this is kind of what... Uh, you know, you, I think that you were asking for it's like, what do I need? Yeah, well, look, I mean, and, and yeah, and and I and I'm sure there are others in this same category. I've I've played this uh, for years, 10, 10 years probably, and I've the way I've been working on it, I've still never been able to get it fast and comfortable. So I'm I am 100% prepared to break this right down and see if I can finally get it. And um, I can't wait to kind of show that progress and be able to say, wow, Fred is the magician here. He can help, <laughs> he can help anyone play this. <laughs> well, well, I mean, and, and it's great what you're doing. And I will also say a word of, I mean, I, I totally believe in you being able to do this. I will also suggest to you that you might enjoy taking another etude that you've never played, uh, just randomly saying opus 10 number four, opus 10 number five, although I'd, I'd like to show you an orientation of how to do the rotation. Maybe opus 10 number four. Uh, what's another one? There's, uh, there's, there's others that I would love to play, <laughs> but, but you... Number eight, yeah. 
but 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 my point is is that what you just said is related to to sort of finish up our session with you know the Malcolm Gladwell thing is that um, it's not that you were a duffer but you were using perhaps not your highest um, uh, understanding of how to play with greater ease your best choreography and and yet you have been playing it and so you have actually uh, you know, actually practice some of that in. So I remember I worked for a while in, in the first part of my recovery with Julian Mark, and he pointed out to me that each successive piece that you play after you, when you're reworking things, gets better. And so you might enjoy, even as you're taking on this this mountain, uh, that that you you take another one on that's that's from scratch. Yes. And, uh, and, and see how it goes. But you know, I don't want to discourage you or anybody else from taking on old repertoire. But just know that it is a little bit, those, those old habits are tenacious. They can mm. stay with you. Mm. Yep, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Um, we've got a comment. Rebecca says, this is so interesting and useful. Thanks both. So thank you, Rebecca. In fact, I wonder if I can, let me uh, practice, practice my, uh, my skills here if I can. Your technology. <laughs> Will this work? Uh, yeah, I can see there it is, here it comes. Yeah, I love it. Um, so look, I think given the time, we're almost at the top of the hour, we might leave the trills. I have plenty to work on, Fred. Yeah, I, th I think so too. That, that, I usually don't like to have it be too overwhelming at once. And then we, this has been a wonderful session. I just, I, it's a blast working with you. And uh, I just, I think you're, I can see that you get it and you just you need the chance to like all of us to to experiment now we go back to the laboratory we do our work and, and you know uh, think about uh, especially i'd remind you that uh, when you make an initiation um be careful like cause so many people do the same thing where we you come to hold up the tension above and right you can allow yourself to be completely loose and then up and go it's that it's that's that sensation of just like you said, I think you said, uh, like, if you were... I don't yeah, know, like, it's, it's like, it's like the, um, doing this, uh, and then off the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stage <laughs> exit, exit, stage left. Right. Yeah, so, uh, I like it. All of that's, uh, you know, really, really helpful. As long, and it's better than that, because in, in Snagglepuss's case, he would actually stop for a split second, and then the animators would send him the other way. But it's, <laughs> but it's a vivid idea. In our case, we want to be a little bit more fluid, but, but uh, whatever helps. Um, thank you, Fred. There was one little question here from uh, Sangita. Sangita, so I'm not exactly sure how to say her name. I did not quite understand what was meant by overlap. So um, my understanding is that uh, rather than playing, but basic, I mean, what you're really suggesting is try every combination of breaking down these sequences of arpeggios, in particular, in, in the case of the music I'm working on, and keep. Uh, when you start, when you do a phrase, so let's say it's a one, two, three, four, go back to the three, three, four, three, one, two, three, and keep overlapping where you stopped the last time. Is that is that the simplest way to explain it for Sanjita? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think if you were thinking of, um, uh, I just filmed just the other day the the first Cherny eight measure exercise. Oh yeah, you were telling me about these, yeah. And, and, and so if I just show the, that goes like this. Oops. So, so you have this figure, it's a bunch of 16th notes. So the first time, if the first 16th, these are groups of four, you would go, that would be the first one. And then you would go on. So overlapping that would be starting on a note other than the E. The next one, if you started on the second note of the group, it would be the G, so you'd have, right? And so you're going from the second group of four sixteenths to the second group of the next four sixteenths, et cetera. So that's an overlap. Another overlap would be to go to the third note, right? Now I'm gonna go, right? And then there'd be one more overlap, which would be the fourth one, which would be, now I can, now I'm gonna go from the fourth 16th to the 4 16th, etc. So I'm hoping that that's that Sangeeta and others will understand that we're just putting things in little phase shifts. But that was a fast microwave explanation. You have to do it also, don't just go automatically on. Sometimes you'll need to do two or three times on the same one. You might have to go, right? And, and maybe you'll do it slower once. 
and then a little faster or fast. And then you say, okay, did that sound good? Did it feel good? Okay, I can go on. That part of pausing and evaluating is the part that I think most pianists and students do the least. It's what I was saying, and Tim mm. said that he learned the same way. We just did it automatically. Our teacher yeah. said, and he was oh, rushing to the next one. And mm. you're like, okay, I'm a good boy. I did all my rhythms, right? But if you're not listening, if you're not sensing, if you're not feeling, if you're not really using, you know, really optimal first class or hopefully world class technique, then then you're 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 practicing at whatever that level is and really putting that tension in. Yeah, I'm thinking of it too. Um, in the coda of that, the scherzo, this section. That section, I definitely use exactly the same practice technique there too. Yeah. Yep. Next week I got I uh, I'll, or two weeks we'll, we'll meet again and I've got a technique for you to put the, uh, the hands together. But I think we probably have to wrap up for today. Yeah, I think so. Well, look, Fred, thank you so much. Um, Sanjita says uh, thank you. Uh, Vanessa says so much info now to process. So we've got two weeks to process, everyone. Fred and I are going to meet back here again, same time, same place. If you want to revisit anything that we've talked about, then these are going to be in my YouTube channel and on Facebook. Um, and we're likely to share these with Fred as well. He may put them up on his channels too. So thanks for joining us. We've had um, eight to 15 people joining us, which is great. We'll hopefully we'll build that over time because I have learned an absolute ton, Fred. It's been great. Hey, my pleasure. I'm really looking forward to more. This is a lot of fun. Brilliant. All right, everyone. See you later.